Okay, I think uh, let's start the next session for people in this room and also pe many people I think online. Uh, so welcome to Metaverse uh, Plenary Panel. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Professor Michael Sheng. So I together with uh, Professor Xiaofei Xu, uh, we are chair this uh, particular uh, session. So just to introduce, I think, uh, Professor Xiaofei Xu from uh, Harbin Institute of Technology. And so he lead a very successful, I want to say extremely successful uh, research center on, around the services. So this year, believe it or not, that uh, they celebrate 30 years of this uh, uh, research center. So Professor Xiaofei Xu will uh, join us remotely. Um, so we're also quite fortunate to have a world leaders in relevant area uh, to join us as a panel. So here I just give you a very brief introduction about our uh, panel members. The first one is a Professor Wellan Benatala from uh, Dupli, uh, Dupli University, uh, um, uh, City University. So uh, I think he has more than 20 years in service computing particularly in area of service composition uh, and other areas. So many of his work is seminal. I think many people uh, know him very well. Um, so the next one, uh, so Professor uh, Ben Atala will ask remotely. So the next one is a Professor Zhong Chen from Peking University. So he is a director of a Metaverse uh, Technology Institute in Beijing University. So very lucky, I think today that Professor uh, Zhong Chen is here in person with us. Uh, thank you, Zhong. So the next one is uh, Bob uh, Gasta. So he is a senior director of a wireless networking lab uh, in InterDigital. So he has 20 years of very successful industry experience. So he will add a very valuable input to, to the discussions of this uh, today's session uh, panel. Uh, so Bob also joined in remotely. So the next one is a Professor Abed uh, Sadiq. So um, he's a leading scholar in intelligent computing, communication, and uh, applications, so on. Uh, his work recognized by quite a few uh, awards. Uh, so recently, he very focused on digital twins. So he also joined us remotely. So finally, I think we have Professor Melinda Sin. Um, so I think maybe I don't have to introduce him. So he's so well known. So have close to 40 years, uh, very active research experience in, in many research areas. He's very well known in several areas such as the multi uh, agents, with computing, uh, social network, and so on. So this is our panel. Uh, I think it's, it's a really exciting uh, panel with uh, leading researchers here. So I think before we start, I just talk a little bit of the motivation, why we organize this particular session, talk about uh, mod, uh, metaphorics. So I think we know that uh, service computing is already more than uh, two decades, right? So many, many people very actively working on service uh, research. But unfortunately, I think um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, impact to the uh, real world is still very limited. So that's why I think uh, several years ago, a, a small group of people began to do some reflections. It's starting a very small workshop in MIT, uh, led by Asman Bokaya. Then later we have uh, about 40, 20, uh, 24, 24 experts in this area to give the input. So why this is the reason? So how can we do better? Um, so I think we do have a number of uh, findings. Okay, so the first one, of course, I'm not mentioning here. So there's uh, so many, many uh, standards about uh, web services, service related technology. They all sometimes conflating, create lots of confusion. But the other one is really, I think, very important uh, related to today. So it's really, I think, with service research, uh, develop your uh, technology. Actually, we don't consider too much about those very important emerging uh, technology area. 
So this, I think uh, people know that so far, this is, I think, around uh, 2010. So we reached this uh, number three, uh, third platform. So you know that the first platform is a mainframe, then collide server, now it's a cloud. So around the 2010, then we, we reach this, um, this uh, uh, third platform. So you can see the main technologies in this uh, uh, platform, basically mobile computing, big data, uh, cloud, and so on, social, social computing. So web service, service tech naturally are not given too much support to these uh, emerging, very important areas. So just to give you an example, then we actually did some investigations, right? So you can see for cloud computing, cloud services, right? So surprisingly, very, very poor um, adoptions. So only very small uh, portion of uh, a real world cloud service application actually use web service technology. So obviously we want to avoid such kind of a mystic uh, in the future. So nowadays I think pretty much we enter to the fourth platform. So this pretty much focus around ambient computing. So I think uh, internet things, AI, uh, metaverse, all is very important to belong to this uh, number four platform. Uh, so really, I think uh, uh, service computing community as a whole, when you talk about this uh, uh, fourth platform, those uh, very important technology like metaverse, right? So we really need to uh, not repeat the previous uh, mistake, right? So we need to consider what are the unique uh, technical challenges, characteristics brought by Metaverse. Then when we develop our research, we need to consider them. So in this way, then hopefully where there's more uh, in practice as in real world adoption of the service technologies. So hopefully I think this make it clear the motivation for today's uh, panel discussion. <clears throat> so I think this is a few key questions we proposed. Uh, for this panel discussion, okay? Uh, so I don't repeat here later. I think uh, 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 panel members will uh, talk about that. Uh, so in terms of how we run today's panel, uh, first of all, I think uh, we ask each panelist uh, just to give us their perspective, consider those key questions. Uh, so at the beginning, I think use about five minutes each, talk about that. Uh, so then, uh, before, of course, we also invite uh, Professor Xiao Xu, uh, Xiao Fei Xu, uh, give his uh, uh, opinion or, or view around the uh, metaverse services. So then, I think all the panel uh, list then will uh, give the very briefly talk about their uh, their uh, perspective. So after that, I think hopefully we have some in depth uh, discussion in particular uh, area topics. So then. Uh, then we close the session. So next, uh, can we invite uh, Professor Brian Bra Benatala? Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, very good. Oh, okay. Um, good morning, everybody. And if you can move the slides. Okay, so uh, I try to answer the question that my in, in one of the slides earlier. In order to answer this question, I kind of try to use the traditional service-oriented architecture where I look at the difference at the interface level and that how we communicate with services and the middleware level and then the services themselves. So, uh, I mean, this first slide, for me, a difference between what we call meta services and traditional services is in the rich interaction that the metaverse uh, provide. For example, we can see multimodal interaction using text, uh, 3D, and, and, and so on. So from interface perspective, uh, with this, these services will deliver more realistic and rich experience. Um, it's kind of closer to the human uh, than the computer, for example, the traditional services 
in general, they are provided through apps, APIs, things like that, where we push the user to, to the technology. Here, it's almost the, op the other way around. The second difference is in what I call augmentation. Um, this kind of uh, service architecture basically provide opportunity to augment um, a human interaction with, like for example, I can interact with things, interact with digital uh, agents, I can interact with the human, but I can also represent I uh, have a virtual representation or phys of, of a physical asset, for example. I can have a representation of a farm, of, uh, of an office, of uh, things like that. So that's, that's uh, kind of very interesting. And this is manifested in, in, in large number of applications. Um, for example, in agriculture, you can see the, 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 the crops, you can see the, the, the positions, you can... Um, interact with that, uh, for example, identifying problems, uh, watering the crops and things like that. One major application where we see this is really education and training, where we can have more rich environment for, for training and things like that compared to traditional work. Other application like remote work, prototyping, and in my area of business process management, for example, you know, you can basically look at the physical asset the representation of the physical asset. You can see the flow uh, between these assets. You can talk to these assets. You can command, you can uh, make changes, things like that. Other application, for example, elderly management, um, it, it's a great opportunity and so on. So that is from the interface perspective. Can you move the next slide, please? So, um, when we have services, we also have, in general, middleware that connect the interfaces to the services themselves. Um, so, in this case, um, the challenges were, were the, 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 the capability that the, the middleware need to have is to be able to process multimodal input, like, for example, from speech to text to touch, gesture, seeing, hearing, listening, and things like that. And we should the, the, we should the, we should be able to interact with both uh, virtual and digital entities, uh, and so on. So at the moment, the middleware is really to some extent written by hand, uh, meaning a development-driven or rule-based approach. But there is an opportunity into improving that dramatically. For example, if we leverage LLMs uh, for things like orchestration where we take a user command and try to find services and interact with them, interact with other agents and things like that, maybe interacting with human tools, um, things and so on through APIs and orchestration and things like that. Just to uh, clarify this, for example, in the metaverse, a human or agent, whatever, will be represented by agent and this agent, they have behavior, they interact with each other, so we can imagine how a generative AI can help us bootstrap this instead of writing all the rules uh, uh, and that, that, that dictate the behavior of agent and, and the, and the interaction. So that's a great opportunity that the modern AI can provide to scaling uh, this kind of technology. So at the end, an orchestration engine in this environment or a middleware in this environment should have the capacity to handle properties or, or, or functionalities like conversation, sensing, perception, reflection, planning, uh, reacting, and things like that. And most importantly, uh, is also the capacity to to store, to capture and store memories uh, of interaction, to to, con to be able to continuously learn and to act autonomously in, in in certain cases if we want them to do that. Can you please move to the next slide? Uh, so from technical challenge, and I only focused those that are relevant to this, this, uh, this part of the architecture I mentioned. So at the interface level, the challenge is that if we support all this re recent interaction and human-like interaction, we will have to 
although there is progress in the in all this, but we'll have to deal with ambiguity in communication. For example, human leverage a lot, implicit communication. What I talked to you about yesterday, I assume that you know it when we remember it when we talk today, so I don't have to repeat it all the time. Uh, we also need to cater for diversity. We humans say same thing differently, things like that. And also human compact, very complex intent in, in, in very small uh, and short sentences. So we should be able to understand this complexity and decompose it into uh, very composite behavior, let's say. On the side of interaction with services and processes themselves, I think that we should be able to constrain this the behavior um, to what makes sense from functionality point of view, but also constraining, as I will come back to it later, is very important for things like um, stopping an, an unwanted and desirable uh, behavior um, and, and, and so on. So one technical problem is that we should be able to integrate this kind of policies that guide this behavior rule or whatever constraints into the behavior of agents in uh, the metaverse. The second point is that we should be able to manage and reason about a large amount of uh, uh, memory to be able not only to personalize the metaverse to, 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 to the users, but also to make uh, general inferences, learn from that, compose things that were not composed before and things like that. So technically these days, people are trying to do these kind of things in general, not only for metaverse through injecting knowledge into models, like for example, through what's called fine tuning or zero shot, few shot learning and things like that. There is some progress, but a lot is needed on, uh, on this. Um, can you move to the next slide, please? <clears throat> and a key uh, important message I want to, to, to mention is that like the progress in, in social uh, services, like social media or AI, as we talk about it, quality is, is very important as well is in, in, in the uh, metaverse. So for example, there are quality problems that exist in other services, but they just because of the scale, if we manage to build metaverse, which is not the case today, but it's going to be probably very soon, manage to build through uh, advanced AI to build the metaverse very in, in very scalable way. Uh, these kinds of uh, problems like malicious information, disinformation, toxicity, or in general malicious behavior and, and traditional attacks, um, vulnerability, they just, are will be easier and uh, to do in in this kind of virtual environment and the scale is the same thing but but uh, uh, attackers will have uh, the technology in their side as well but there will be new problems um, like uh, addiction for example you know uh, people may be well, may be addicted to this kind of technology and things like that so what to do about that other problems is the environmental impact of, of building these kind of systems and, and so on. Another problem, uh, like accessing the technology and equity and things like that, not every country, not every human will be able to support the cost of accessing and benefiting from this technology equally. Um, can you move to the next slide? <clears throat> So to, to summarize, you know, uh, uh, there are opportunities, for example, okay, so major differences are that the interfaces of these services are multimodal, um, are more human-centric, uh, more uh, um, rich, and, and so on. We will see um, multimodal foundation models, um, for example, as in EI, emerging as a way to build the middleware of, of this technology. Uh, of course, there will be always a human in the loop and it desired um, and, and so on for both uh, generating and assessing the, the behavior of the metaverse agent and, and their interaction and things like that. I'm, I also mentioned context and, and memory basically where we need to manage a lot of it and 
and hopefully um, also doing a lot of learning from that so 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 the agent can build some autonomy and so on um the, the i mentioned the, the the problem related to quality control and governance in general so we should be from, from day one having a kind of an architecture design and, and, and so on that support the operationalization of human values and policies and things like that and inject that in the design and the implementation of the metaverse agent and, and their uh, interactions. We should also be able to teach this agent basically to, to comply with values and policy. So at the end, um, what, I'm, what I'm pushing here is to integrate quality control as a first class citizen in 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 building these agents and and scaling them so that that that's the end of my slides thank you okay thanks next is a professor john chen uh, so he's here in person good morning uh everyone so it's my great pleasure to come here in person to join this uh, conference so that is also remind me um, the first time in the year 2004, we organized uh, the first workshop in Beijing together with IBM and uh, Tsinghua University talking about uh, uh, services, science, uh, technology, and management. Uh, but recent years, um, <coughs> work in also in the domain specific uh, software engineering and uh, I was assumed uh, uh, director of the newly established uh, Metaverse uh, Technology Institute under the School of uh, Computer so uh, uh, Science uh, this February. And uh, we bring together uh, the professor's team from uh, uh, human computer interface uh, AR, VR teams and uh, the distributed computing and uh, <coughs> uh, blockchain and uh, uh, network security uh, team together. So we work together uh, to establish the uh, new uh, curriculum and the uh, research uh, target as uh, metaverse. <coughs> Um, actually, um, Metaverse is not uh, just a uh, uh, unique uh, technology, but uh, they have a group a set of uh, technologies that can support um, Metaverse uh, applications. Next, next slide, please. Next uh, slide. Would you please? Oh, perhaps uh, yeah, there is uh, some uh, delay. Oh. Okay, so <clears throat> regarding to the, the panel discussion, um, actually uh, I select some uh, topics. So for the metaverse, uh, how it changed the world. So we can have uh, the uh, covered uh, papers uh, uh, provided by the Marshall Board in the Times. So they say the next digital area will change everything into the metaverse. So from the software <coughs> uh, aspect, the so metaverse is an advanced uh, internet application, but the, uh, the metaverse is with many features or some uh, combination of the features uh, like uh, the 3D web or spatial computing, so we can experience the, uh, some advancement uh, with the Pluto Pro and uh, the Vision Pro from uh, Apple in, in the industry, right? But also uh, regarding to the blockchain, because uh, they bring some new ideas about uh, the economy, new economy or digital economy uh, that have big uh, impact with uh, uh, many things 
uh, based on the internet. And also uh, very close to the AI GC, especially for the generative uh, <clears throat> trained uh, large model, yeah. So if you try to ask this five question to chat GPT, so you can get uh, uh, several pages of answer. That is uh, quite helpful for, uh, for the summary to uh, the very beginning. You would like to know uh, about, uh, yeah, uh, <clears throat> the metaverse and uh, Web3 and many other things, right? But I think it's, uh, <clears throat> the metaverse is uh, uh, really important to, uh, to build upon the Web 3.0 uh, protocols. So the new digital economy that may change the way of the current Web 2 economy uh, scheme. So this is also a big thing that maybe in the future, uh, even for the, uh, the service computing, uh, will get involved uh, such kind of uh, research directions. And we also have the uh, metaverse established a new way of uh, human in, uh, computer interactions and uh, the change even some kind of connection uh, among the physical world, the social world, and even the mental world. Uh, so metaverse is also a metaphor for the new way uh, to cyberization uh, uh, in between these three words. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, Metaverse, they would like to bring some new things to compare with uh, traditional internet services. So uh, here highlights something like, for example, the mixed real, uh, reality or extensive reality will provide uh, a uh, new way for the immersive uh, experience. And AIGC will provide a more active and a smart uh, responsible uh, to the communications in between uh, machine and uh, uh, the humans. And uh, they get even uh, most better uh, user experience uh, when you use a uh, uh, dozen of uh, uh, this software uh, and the services of worldwide. So <clears throat> the Web 3.0, the new digital economy scheme, it's, uh, uh, I think it's a new driving force to establish the, uh, the architecture and uh, the solution uh, for the uh, future metaverse uh, applications. And uh, why we have a more emphasis on the Web3, uh, and even Web3.0, uh, they have an argument, uh, yeah, it's a little bit of difference uh, with uh, Web3, because Web3.0, it's uh, earlier uh, compared with the Web3 uh, come from uh, Garmin Wood, uh, generated from the Instagram, and uh, the Web3 Foundation, but uh, the protocols uh, regarding to the Web3 is much uh, more emphasized and even uh, some startup based on the Web3 uh, protocols, they have uh, tried uh, many kind of um, things uh, based on the blockchain or cryptocurrency uh, for the Web3. 3.0, they also make more emphasize on the, the, the ownership of the future uh, data. Uh, but they have a different uh, uh, solution. For example, uh, Tim Bernsley uh, suggests uh, to put the data of the user data in the pod. So the, the access control of the pod will be uh, first a priority belong to the user to compare with uh, the platform and the user. So 
anyway, uh, Web 3.0 and Web, uh, Web 3, they share the same uh, target of the future is let the user take the ownership, take the control of the data um, <clears throat> compared with the Web 2 uh, uh, scheme, right? Well, the opportunity for metaverse uh, services, I think, uh, the service of computing, uh, so they have a uh, opportunity to based on the Web3 protocol and the blockchain or digital <coughs> major technology to provide uh, um, building uh, economy system and uh, that can support the digital assets exchange for the metaverse. And uh, even uh, the AIGC will uh, enhance the user experience via the uh, intelligence uh, interactions, automated events, and the personalized uh, uh, recommendations and the, the dynamic uh, environment for the metaverse uh, services. So <clears throat> it provides a lot of uh, opportunities, especially uh, so when a user, they have the ownership of their uh, data. So their data can be a new kind of a digital assets so <clears throat> the Web 3.0 protocols will provide the, the foundation for interoperability uh, among uh, many uh, metaverse, uh, metaverses. Um, so it can let user to move their avatars and the digital assets across different metaverse platform uh, seamlessly. Well, uh, <clears throat> I think finally a, the typical uh, scenario uh, for me, I suggest uh, to target us uh, uh, education and uh, training. Uh, so there are so many kind of uh, uh, scenarios, and especially uh, most of success uh, come from the uh, the game uh, <clears throat> like uh, Roblox. Uh, they incorporate uh, uh, metaverse concept into uh, their business, so they change the way to build uh, the traditional uh, game platform to bring together uh, the uh, designers, creators, and uh, the players together and share a new economy um, uh, scheme. Uh, so why we choose uh, education? Because the education, they can bridge uh, from Web 2 to the Web 3 and they have a lot of efforts that they can extend from the uh, VR applications and uh, to try to incorporate um, Web3 uh, features together uh, to build a new way of a metaverse uh, services um, and uh, combine them together with uh, co uh, service computing. And, but uh, the one key issue is about the incentive uh, mechanism uh, how we can use uh, such kind of things uh, to <coughs> revolution uh, the uh, relationship uh, from uh, teaching, learning in the communities. Uh, so they may have uh, uh, most uh, uh, innovative uh, things happened for the metaverse education uh, applications. Well, that's my um, uh, some uh, opinions uh, regarding to the uh, panel uh, questions. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Professor Zhong Chen. Uh, so I, I saw Professor Xiaofei Xu now is online. Hi. So can Hi. I see if everything is okay? Yeah. So I uh, so it's not easy for me to get in. Uh, so can yeah. you help me right now? Yeah. Yeah. Everything looks fantastic. So. Yeah, I think uh, Professor Xiaofei, she actually is one of the main driver behind uh, Metaverse Service. So I would say it's very valuable to hear a little bit of what his view about the Metaverse Service is. So let's, let's go back to his slides. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so, <laughs> Finally. <yeah. laughs> Okay, so yeah, ladies and gentlemen, good morning uh, by you. So for me, it's uh, midnight right now. Uh, yeah, it's my pleasure to uh, 
share this uh, session with uh, Michael together. So uh, this time I would like to talk about the metaverse service concept architecture and the service space. Yeah, next please. Next please, yeah. So as you know, yeah, so since uh, metaverse was presented initially by uh, Neil Stephenson in 1992, many people or organize, organizations have given their uh, understanding on metaverse and its characteristics. And uh, Matthew explains that metaverse is a massive, uh, massively scaled and inter interoperable network of real time rendered 3D virtual worlds. Yeah, next please. Next. Next. Next please. Yeah. Michael, next. Yeah. So my, my understand is that so the metaverse is an IT enabled digital virtual ecosystem of human life, work, creation, and entertainment. Uh, with the form of digital twin, digital natives, virtual real uh, symbiosis, and virtual real interactions. Here is uh, the list of the, the support technology for metaverse. Yeah, next please. Next. So let's consider the concept of metaverse service. Yeah. So in fact, in the metaverse, uh, the behavior, activity, and uh, business processes, uh, so they perform based on sequence of workflow or uh, service processes. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's necessary to introduce uh, services into metaverse. So the metaverse service are the uh, series of massive, complicated digital services formed by uh, virtual services and uh, virtual reality mixed uh, services uh, through service convergence across uh, multi-domain, multi-network, and multi-worlds, dealing with pro business process of digital avatars, digital teams, and digital natives in metaverse that interconnected with the physical reality world. Next, next please. Yeah, so I think yeah, from traditional internet plus service to into the metaverse services, there are a lot of change. Yeah, like uh, the entities uh, that you will face to service teams, virtual native services, uh, met met metaverse wear services. You will face to new agents, new experience, platforms, new resource, new network, and new governance. Let's place. Next, please. Yeah, here I show you an architecture of metaverse services. You can you can see the uh, in metaverse ecosystem. The metaverse the, the metaverse system uh, sys, uh, services exist in uh, metaverse space and physical uh, reality world through several layer. Uh, so the services are convergent uh, bottom up. Uh, through the, pass through the infrastructure layer, local layer, service community layer, converge uh, converge the solution layer to the virtual reality interface layer to provide the services to the virtual customers and uh, real human customers. Yeah, next please. Yeah, from the view of uh, uh, domain supply relationship. I consider there would be a metaverse service space, including customers' personal and community life space, provider and group collaboration space, metaverse service scene activity space, metaverse service competition space, metaverse service knowledge space, and metaverse service resource space. And these spaces are supported by third party or fourth party metaverse service support platforms, management platforms, and metaverse service assurance systems. This is the whole picture to describe the metaverse services. Yeah, please, next. And let's consider how can we focus on the technology and the theory and technology of metaverse services. So we need to research on principles and expression of metaverse services, and requirement engineering, methodology, 
open uh, operation of uh, metaverse services, assurance method of metaverse service, and we also need to pay attention on uh, application of metaverse services. Because of time limitation, I wouldn't to describe in detail. Next, please. And we can also classify the theory and the technology into several cl uh, cluster. Yeah, so corresponding to the feature of uh, metaverse services, like a new architecture. Uh, here we concern about new forms, architecture models, and characteristics and properties of metaverse services. And we can we focus on new experience, new convergence. New governance and the new quality assurance. Next, please. We need also pay attention on the typical application uh, scenarios of metaverse services, like metaverse plus healthcare services, elderly care services, entertainment services, industrial services, metaverse education services, and smart city service services, and so on. Next, please. Here, I would like to recommend uh, several papers organized by CCF uh, TCSC, Technical Committee on Service Computing in China. So these papers uh, are about uh, new forms and new trends of metaverse services issued in the communications of CCF, China Computer Federation. Next, please. OK, so finally, uh, I make my conclusion. Yeah, so the metaverse brings great change of a social ecosystem and the service world. So there are uh, many new issues and new problems about metaverse services need us to explore and research on. The metaverse service space facilitates a good platforms to develop the ecosystem of metaverse services. The metaverse services application scenario would be also very interested and uh, marvelous in the new uh, metaverse world. So we can see the future is coming. Let's get into the metaverse and create metaverse services for the future life. So that's my uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. Okay, uh, thanks, Professor Xiaofei So now we continue our panel uh, list uh, opinion. So I think next is uh, Bob. Just quickly go to his part. Perfect, thank you. So hello, my, my name is uh, Bob Gazda. I'm with uh, InterDigital. Uh, I'm a senior director in our wireless networking lab. Uh, InterDigital is a uh, wireless and video technology uh, research company. Uh, so uh, I would uh, characterize us in a nutshell. Uh, if you see like a company such as maybe Qualcomm or a Nokia uh, would have like a CTO office or an advanced R&D lab, uh, InterDigital is, is basically that, but as a, but as a standalone, standalone business. So um, if you can go to the next slide, please. And here uh, I'm specifically going to be talking about um, some visions for 6G. I'll talk a little bit about 5G too, just as a, as a baseline or a context. Uh, in relation of uh, distribution of compute and communications, uh, maybe even call this uh, convergence of compute and communications and how that fits into um, metaverse services. So if you can click the next slide, please. Okay, so one of the um, um, uh, emerging versions for 6G. So I, I'm a uh, I, I'm coming from the uh, uh, wireless communication side of the world. So uh, we're already starting to talk about uh, some 6G and visions for 6G, uh, even as 5G uh, rolls out and and evolves. Uh, and one of these concepts is converging compute and communications uh, together. So I. Um, I apologize for using uh, a lot of uh, lingo here from the um, cellular side of the world, like UE and RAN and things like this. I'll, I'll kind of say what these things are. Um, I just want to contrast what you see today in the 5G system, which is the top picture there. Uh, terminal devices, they're called UEs or user equipment. Uh, they're, they're generally viewed as untrusted devices from the 
uh, cellular communication system, and they consume uh, network applications and services. So they they are consumers of services that appear in the network. Uh, they could be in the internet, which is that far gray box off to the side, like things in the cloud or in the internet, or now in 5G, they're integrated in these concepts of edge computing, which is embedding compute resources either within the wireless access networks or very close to the um, points of access the, where the cell towers or the uh, aggregation points are in the wireless network. So you have this idea of the um, compute moving closer to devices and the 5G systems provide capabilities to discover and consume edge computing services. And what we like to do is, and I'll talk about how this fits into metaverse in the next slide, but one vision for 6G is converging compute and communications together and seeing a much wider distribution of computing with communications in 6G, kind of like what the picture is shown at the bottom there, even extending down to devices themselves. So where devices can uh, share and collaborate with services amongst themselves. And this is really important for uh, ultra low latency applications, especially those that may uh, require the consumption and processing of a uh, high volume of multimodal data like you would see in metaverse. So if I say this again, the 6G systems are gonna be highly distributed in both the wireless compute domain and the computing domains. And that is required to deliver uh, ubiquitous services so if we talk about uh, really high performance uh, compute with high performance data, uh, there's really no way to solve that other than bringing compute resources closer to where their uh, consumption, uh, consumption may be. And if we have a, a compute fabric, kind of what's shown in the picture there, a uh, key question is, is how can you dynamically distribute applications, network functions, service workloads, across that fabric to realize metaverse scenarios or or others or or other uh, types of things and you can view that compute fabric extending from end user devices uh, vehicles on premise so that could be either in um, consumer homes could be in enterprises like businesses could be stores shops the uh, public uh, mobile network operators and the cloud uh, trust is a very uh, interesting component here. So like I said before, that in 5G, generally devices are viewed as untrusted devices uh, or, or untrusted to the network. So here the view for 6G is the 6G devices will have levels of trust where they can share resources amongst themselves. So it could be sharing um, um, capabilities like computing, storage, networking, so I can deploy uh, maybe a function onto a nearby device, but they could also be sharing services. So that could be data, could be digital assets, could be virtual twins, uh, could be sensing, could be intelligence, things like this. And then how do you share them across users, applications, and domains? Uh, so maybe you can do a lot of stuff that's talked about in metaverse today in a private a localized network, but then how can you do that more at more at scale? So if you can hit the next slide, please. Uh, and this is where we sit, see this fitting in with uh, metaverse, especially if we want to say, hey, I want to get to the point where I've got uh, immersive XR uh, that's beyond, um, say, AR or VR. Okay, I see I have a typo at the top. It should say 5G AR VR, but but. But I'll put that aside. So what, one of the interesting par parts of this is uh, the combination of high bandwidth multimodal data. So uh, large amounts of data that need to be that need um, high levels of processing. So running AI models that may be doing some sensing, say, on the combination of video, audio and uh, radar, something like that. Um, that's going to require consuming large amounts of data processing them with large amounts of compute, um, and then maybe even doing things like rendering, right? I need to render a scene on top of what I detected in uh, an incoming video, 
and render video back out. And all that needs to be done with some ultra end-to-end uh, -end, um, uh, latency, uh, you know, motion to photon latency, which could get down into the seven to 15 uh, milliseconds. But I want to do that. Uh, and now I'm talking about 6G. So I'm kind of like envisioning the future, but do that on smaller energy efficient devices than what you see today. Uh, even with uh, the release from our friends from uh, Apple, right? They have a very heavyweight, high processing uh, device um, in the, the Vision Pro that they just released. But I want to do this on lightweight devices with high battery life in consumer level price, price points like um, XR glasses versus AR, AR headsets. Um, the picture at the bottom there that distributed uh, collaborative services, that's a vision of how a uh, XR application can be deployed across lightweight devices that are just maybe doing some positioning uh, and doing some display to the user. I can do rendering of the scenes on that with some on-premise or um, uh, very, very local, very close um, edge compute, uh, maybe some um, other components uh, like coordination, doing some federated learning on gameplay, maybe some calculation of physics can be done at other places in the network. Um, and an interesting piece we see in this is how can we do this in a collaborative way across applications? So maybe taking it back to just the previous um, presentation from Professor Wu, uh, it was showing um, uh, um, elder care as a metaverse application at the same time as uh, gaming, uh, gaming applications. So how can I do uh, combine both of those together, right? Where in my home, I've got my children participating in the game uh, that some sensing of the environment is happening. Uh, at the same time, my elderly mother is, is living with me uh, and I've got an elder care application that's detecting um, whether she's fallen or not. So how can we collaborate those together and do, um, do so in a trustworthy, privacy-preserving type of way? Uh, these are not going to be met with the uh, um, uh, capabilities in 5G systems. So new capabilities need to get added into wireless networks, like I said, to do this at scale over wireless systems. Um, I have one last slide, so if you can just hit the next one. Uh, this is just some places where it may be interesting to learn more uh, about these concepts or topics that I was just mentioning. Uh, first bullet there at the top is the Next G Alliance. Uh, this is a vision setting body in North America um, that's kind of setting the technology vision and requirements for 6G. Uh, they have a 6G library with all kinds of white papers. Uh, it complements things like um, uh, HEXA that you find in Europe, uh, some work going on in India or China. So there's many 6G vision bodies. This just happens to be the one in North America. Uh, they have two good white papers. One is on 6G distributed cloud compute and communications. Um, that's kind of like a requirements vision setting paper. And then they just recently uh, released the technologies for the wide area cloud, which is the same topic uh, that's pointing out some research challenges. Um, the next two papers are ones that, that we've been involved with here at InterDigital. Uh, one is in IEEE Communications Magazine. It's about realizing edge computing on mobile, uh, mobile wirelessly connected devices compared to the um, fixed built into the network edge that you see today in uh, 5G networks. And the, um, the last paper there at the bottom is uh, um, distributed ledger technology. Uh, so it goes beyond metaverse. That's one of the examples, but how can you use uh, DLTs or blockchain technology in beyond 5G, AKA 6G systems. And that's, that's, that's it. Okay, uh, thanks, Bob. Sorry. Yeah, we'll go to the next one is uh, Professor Sadiq. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm here to talk about, to give my perspective of the metaverse. And uh, can you please go to the next slide? Yeah, uh, the next one, please. So before starting with the metaverse, uh, I want to start with the digital twin. 
because in order to understand uh, uh, how the metaverse changes the world and services, we need to understand that a digital twin is uh, simply uh, a digital replica of any living and non-living uh, physical entity. And hence, uh, it's not uh, necessarily only a virtual representation of uh, uh, or a simulation, but it's really a digital twin uh, tries to bridge the physical world and the virtual world where data uh, is seamlessly transmitted between the two worlds, allowing for, uh, the, for the two entities, the virtual and the real entity to coexist uh, simultaneously and to go to uh, to go interact with them uh, in the same time. Can you go please to the next? I think uh, it's uh, it's the next and is an, that's a digital twin one. But now I need to go to the next one, please. Yes. So and the reason why I talk about the digital twin is be, be is that I foresee the metaverse to be the universe of persistent digital twins, where uh, uh, it, technically, I agree with most of what my colleague previously said. In the persistent digital twin world, which is the universe in my perspective, we have a huge amount of data the, uh, and data services that need to be transmitted and use any type of communication services, uh, 6G, uh, uh, 5G today, LTE and so that we can make sense of those data in through different type of uh, ai uh, be it the traditional machine learning or be it applying uh, large language models in order to have a different type of um, interaction which i call the multi model or multi multi model interaction which is a virtual representation of the digital twin in the metaverse be it through the avatar or be it through even even a, a metaverse uh, cons consisting of a mobile robot around us. So that's for me, a metaverse is really where, where the convergence of five different type of, of uh, the convergence of technology, uh, technologies as they play together to, uh, to build a persi persistent digital twin so that when my, so that the interaction in this virtual world remain active and intact even if i am sleeping for instance while today today what so called metaverse such as roblox uh, Se uh, second life uh, minecraft and that central land when uh, when I am not logged in into the system, my avatar, my my virtual representation uh, disappear, and then I need to reinstate uh, re uh, it. However, in the real metaverse, I believe the, met the digital twin remain intact and continue to receiving information from both the real and the virtual world. Uh, can you go please to the next slide? where a yeah yes so for so the the metaverse will is it transforming the businesses by accelerating a holistic understanding by having an optimal decision making and also by being able to help us make uh, informed effective decisions and taking the proper interactions and actions is a true use of real time of historical data so that we can and make make use of the past, the present, and in order to predict the futures. In my perspective, the metaverse services will be and are motivated by the outcome. They there will be no one case, one metaverse fit all, but they will be tailored to use cases powered by integration of the different uh, technologies and uh, uh, concepts. They are built on data and guided by domain knowledge. And I really like the fact that we mentioned already uh, the LLMs and uh, generative uh, uh, language models and is a metaverse is implemented in this uh, cyber physical 
um, system. So it's uh, where really this uh, inter interconnection between real and virtual become seamless and uh, it's really very difficult, becomes very difficult to differentiate what's real, what's virtual and whether I'm interacting with a real person or a virtual pe person or a virtual uh, s subject. Uh, the size of the opportunity, uh, as described in the next slide, is unlimited. Uh, so please move to the next slide. Uh, as uh, we know that the market size will reach about 800 billion by 2024. And a lot of job will be created. And this is in contrast to what many people uh, perceive that AI and probably the metaverse will, re will affect our jobs. I believe in new jobs and new service jobs will be created. And uh, today, metaverse is, is used. Please move to the next slide. Today's uh, metaverse is used uh, uh, mainly to entertainment, work environment, and social communities. So that's what most of the of us are talking, and plus uh, education. However, I believe the metaverse will hold uh, great uh, promises in finance and sports, and uh, that's some uh, because a, we would like to see a soccer game or uh, if, a, any type of games from the player's perspective rather than from the cameraman perspective. So we, by, by incorporating metaverse into different aspects, into sport, we can be immersed in the game. And that's a big difference to the today's internet, where in today's internet, we we receive the information or we contribute a bit in the information while in the metaverse, we are immersed into in the internet. And definitely finance uh, aspects becomes very important in the metaverse, uh, not only through buying and selling of uh, virtual uh, uh, real estate, but also real real estate, uh, uh, selling them, presenting them into the metaverse, and having a kind of uh, ledgers and uh, based on blockchain uh, technologies to uh, to finish the, or to close uh, any type of agreements. The technical challenges uh, in uh, the technical challenges in my perspective. Uh, are uh, capturing so uh, we need uh, there is a complete what i what i see as a pipeline or a, a pipeline services of challenges from uh, the multi-sensory capturing of the real world state to the sense making of the information and uh, to the communication where we require the low latency high throughput uh, to the security, but also we have societal challenges. Uh, These are ethical challenges, privacy uh, privacy challenges, uh, social norm challenges. Uh, so technically, uh, different uh, type of hand, head uh, head movement mean differently in the real world. So we want uh, the metaverse to be aware of those uh, social norms. And uh, lastly. For me, the metaverse is a bridge between the real and virtual. So it's much more than perceived uh, virtual reality or mixed reality world. It's much more than a new uh, uh, VR conferencing system or a 3D conferencing system. And it's definitively way more than uh, Web3. There is a need to for multi-domain experts uh, to collaborate. Uh, we need the system engineers, the psychologists, the neuroscientists, computer engineer. Where we need law education, but also human computer interaction uh, people to work together so that uh, we can bring those, uh, the whole discipline together to make the most out of the bridge of the real and virtual. And uh, this example here of the handshaking with the robot twin is where we are, we have a 
a simple metaverse which is a conference system but uh, we we just simply immersing ourselves 3d into it is not enough so we need extra extra component in the real world such as the robot arm to feel the handshake so that uh, really this interaction the, the interaction in the real world is transmitted to, to the virtual world and then uh, the feeling of uh, being present immersed together becomes much higher so that's uh, that's uh, my two cents on the metaverse uh, uh, of today okay thanks a lot the final one is professor Menida. hi everyone um, so I'll, I'll keep it short uh, to the elevated uh, five minutes uh, let's go to the next page um, so I try to summarize, uh, you know, my intuitions about what the metaverse in these in these general terms. So uh, the perspective I want to bring together is of uh, what I've been talking about as social technical systems. And sometimes in computer science, people talk about social technical systems, but they talk about them in a loose sort of a way. Uh, and of course, people in the social sciences talk about them in a loose sort of a way, where they might talk about uh, these systems where the technology is. Uh, uh, amorphous. In, in my case, I want to think of it in terms of uh, the technology being, you know, um, a specific agents, and then the interactions not being amorphous, but but actual decisions and uh, information flows between the between the agents. So, if you think of a social technical system for the metaverse, um, you know, you could classify it in various ways. But here are four good um, uh, layers. So, there's the infrastructure which uh, provides the functionality that we are interested in. Uh, a lot of the current excitement is about uh, that infrastructure getting uh, better. Uh, above that is the application layer, and my thinking application would be where you have the the business logic or the game logic or the uh, or the interaction, the, the purpose of the interaction that somebody cares about, uh, but but encoded in the computational way. And above that, I put put it in this narrow waste the notion of governance, where you know how you govern a system is. Uh, uh, is likely to involve you know, cross-cutting um, notions. And then at the very top, what you're providing to the stakeholders is, is experience. So for me, the stakeholders could be users, but uh, providers, but a lot of the interesting interactions are going to be between user and user, whereas some of them will be between users and providers. Uh, and what I like about the metaverse coming in now is that uh, we did many things wrong with services in general, and maybe this is the time to fix our errors. Uh, let's go to the next page. So here I have the same four things uh, in the middle of the uh, of the diagram, uh, reading from the bottom to the top. The infrastructure uh, deals with dynamic world models. I think we need better ways of coordination about engineering worlds. For applications, you need to model uh, meetings and interaction. And especially, I'm interested in, in custom protocols, application level protocols, uh, and support for decentralized computing. Uh, but even more so, you know, the governance. We need to talk about values norms, uh, incentives, namely the concerns and the challenges are about how to design the society, how to negotiate the outcome so that the society is uh, the way you want it to be. And then at the very top, you know, that experience, we are interested in the purpose, like why, why are you doing this? Uh, affect refers to, uh, it's a generalization of emotions, it's emotion plus, you know, other such um, uh, considerations, and then trust. And here again, we want to talk about ethics and safety. And not all of these are matters of policy, not all of these are matters of law uh, even, uh, but, they, but they involve uh, some understanding of, you know, what's the, what's the expected and the right kind of behavior. And based on the experience we desire, we will uh, modify the governance structures accordingly. And uh, one thing I want to point out is that a, a lot of the time in computer science and people talk about uh, governance and uh, uh, and even ethics, they talk about it purely from the standpoint of data handling. So it's about data privacy, about maybe considerations that are like confidentiality or about the sharing of information. Uh, but when you start talking about the real world, so I think for me, the metaverse is not just uh, a virtual world, and like, like my colleagues previously said, it's a combination of the real world. But more, more than that, I mean, it's not just the virtual and physical, but it's real in the sense that it deals with you know, real economics, their real emotions, their real uh, outcomes on the people, like real enjoyment, real hatred, you know, uh, every, everything that we see uh, on the web uh, today, but multiplied many times over, uh, where all these things are real. And so we should think of it in real terms. 
And what that means specifically from the technology and the governance standpoint is that we shouldn't just be talking about data privacy, but we're talking about accountability of all human interactions. Uh, like, like in the bill's example about the handshake, uh, I kept wondering, you know, what happens if, if, if the tool is interesting enough, is it possible for one person to squeeze another person's arm? Is it possible for them to misbehave in other ways? You know, uh, maybe uh, they do some odd action on the hand, right, which conveys through the robot to the other person. Um, they, would that be, so to me, that's not just a question of data privacy, then it's a question of, you know, how you can, what kinds of harm you can carry out and how to make sure that, that you do not. Uh, okay, so with that, I'm still one second short, so I'll stop. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks, Professor uh, Minida Singh. So can I check with Rong then, Rong Zhang, uh, how much time we can have for this session? I know people uh, perhaps also need to go to lunch. <laughs> uh, five minutes, yeah. So. I think really uh, this is a valuable opportunity because we have the leaders in this panel. So I believe that it's really a good opportunity uh, to, for, for the service community uh, to, to get some more insights about their view. Uh, so here, that's, I, I want to really use the rest of time then I just push, our, push, push the panel members to, to, to have some in-depth discussion. I believe these questions, all service community people are very interested and very key uh, to, uh, to know. So perhaps due to the time limit, I will just pick up maybe one or two questions then ask some of the panel member uh, just to elaborate a little bit more uh, on the topic. So I believe it's very valuable for the service uh, community. Um, so the first one is, uh, I would like to invite Brian to um, talk a little bit more. In your view, what are the opportunities for metaverse service research? Uh, yeah, just a second. Yeah, thank you. Uh, again, I think that, okay, so a uh, um, lot of people summarize different perspectives, so that, that's very interesting. There are, um, innovation at the level of protocols, level of interfaces, level of architecture, all these things. And um, for me, I see this as an opportunity for what I call uh, human services, okay, the next generation of services, which um, like, for example, many people were. So it's, it's, it's a mix of digital services, physical services, human and things like interacting together. That that comes with challenges, okay? So I think that at the moment there are protocols, there are people are building this kind of system, things like that, but it's not scalable. And in my opinion, the biggest opportunity is to uh, leverage the recent advances in LNMs, um, foundation models in general, those that generate 3D, those that generate uh, behavior, those that uh, translate from different modalities and, and things like that to be able to build re, um, in a sustainable way this kind of uh, uh, this kind of system. But the, another big challenge is quality control. Some people mentioned it as, as harm, some people mentioned it as governance, some people mentioned it as security, things like that. So that's the biggest, one of the biggest issue to me to not only embed behavior on into this, these agents, but also make sure that these agents respect the society rules, the society norms, the, the, the regulation and, and uh, being fun and things like that. I also mentioned in my talk um, something I call the addiction, you know, I mean, uh, this is happening already with social media. So how we design this technology in a way that is useful, but not addictive uh, to, to, to don't destroy. Uh, uh, uh. So yeah, to make it not only good, but also safe. Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Brian. Lam. So I, I want to think that perhaps we can take one question from the audience before we finish. So please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is Ernesto Damiani. I'm asking a question from the audience. 
because I saw in a number of the slides by the different panelists mentioned uh, the topic of low latency and uh, in a couple also the topic of synchronization, which are two big problems that we have to solve if we want to have a really immersive uh, experience in the metaverse. So uh, the notion is that though I'm not so sure at the moment uh, that we have, first of all, the network the 5G, 6G network is ready everywhere to support this type of uh, synchronization and uh, low latency requirements that we have, especially if we want different people physically located in different places to share the same experience in the metaverse while interacting with each other. So this is uh, something that uh, I would like to ask you, uh, how do you see this problem, the problem of providing realistic experience of interaction in the metaverse and how important you think it is uh, in order to sort of fulfill the promises that, that we have heard from, from the panel. Thank you very much uh, for, I would be interested in the answer by any one of you. I'm sure all of you have to say something on this, but I'm really interested in hearing your point of view. Yeah, thank you for the question. So I'm not sure which panelist uh, uh, to answer the question. <laughs> Uh, if I could, I could start by saying uh, that's a very, very important aspect. And uh, if we look at uh, before the metaverse start getting the hype uh, two years ago, uh, uh, we were talking about the tactile internet where we needed the 10 millisecond uh, delay in order to be able to transmit haptic uh, data, haptic, uh, which require a bidirectional flow of information. So. I believe the, the low latency and uh, the high bandwidth, as well as uh, almost zero jitter, if, uh, if uh, it's uh, possible, doable, those will be very important for, uh, together with the synchronization in, tri uh, in the metaverse. Those are very important aspects uh, for research in the next uh, couple of years, uh, which are not solved yet, uh, despite the fact uh, the, of the advancement of of telecommunication. So uh, uh, for PhDs and for researchers, those are all questions that uh, need to be addressed, researched uh, in order to for the metaverse to find acceptance. Uh, and that's uh, very similar to the way uh, uh, video was going where we had the issues with the synchronization of videos and then we came with a sta uh, different type of standards and uh, standardization bodies are plays an important and crucial role in the development of such uh, technologies. Okay, so any other panelists? I, I, this is Bob. I, I can I can follow up on that oh, yeah. a bit from my perspective. Um, I mean, I I, I think it, you know re realizing the 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 metaverse level services and things like that. So in the in the shorter term, and I, and I'm I'm coming at this from a, like a wireless communications point of view, like I mentioned earlier. Um, it's really only going to be possible in um, um, kind of non-public networks, kind of smaller networks. Um, networks that are kind of single purpose, um, don't have to deal with the high like coverage capacity, right? I mean, the, what is the 5G system? It could be many different things, right? There is the public network, which is really about coverage and capacity, highly designed for the downlink over the uplink, which the uplink is just as important in metaverse type of services as though the downlink is going to be. Um, but you can have non-public network that kind of equally balance uplink with downlink um, for single purposes. Um, you'll see that in factories, right? Digital twinning is a really uh, popular, um, a popular uh, technology that's used in factories of the future or smart factories and these sorts of things. Uh, but I think an, an interesting challenge with the metaverse um, especially to say that, hey, it's really going to be realized at scale is how can you get different, call them metaverses or different domains interop interoperating with each other and then do that in um, kind of where you would say the public networks are now, right? Which they're, they're about coverage and capacity, not about, not, not so much about performance, which is in the, like the non-public network area. 
And I, and I think these, these web 3.0 technologies that are moving towards um, distribution and decentralization, how do those then operate over, over these, over these networks, which are more like client server kind of oriented, I think is going to be very interesting challenge space. Okay. I, I see that you are very happy with the panel these answers. <laughs> so I think without further delay, uh, so we pretty much towards the close of this uh, panel session. So I guess the most important message takeaway is that metaverse is something important, very exciting, then go to change people's life. I think in terms of uh, service computing researcher, we really need to not repeat our previous mistake. We really need to seriously actually think about what are the unique uh, characteristics, challenges brought by uh, metaverse. So in our research, in this way then, uh, our research can be more uh, real world adoption, uh, create more impact. So before I finish, uh, can I invite Professor Xiao Fei Xu also give a few words? Xiao Fei? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Michael. Yeah. So thank, thank all the panelists for your excellent explanation and description about uh, a uh, different wow. view of uh, metaverse uh, services. I, I think, yeah, so the uh, metaverse uh, view uh, is changing and will change uh, a lot of uh, uh, technical social ecosystem and also the service uh, world. And the metaverse service will play an important role in metaverse society. So uh, I do uh, encourage uh, more researchers, especially the young researchers, uh, engage in yeah, engage in the research uh, domain of uh, metaverse services. Yeah, so let's uh, uh, so get into metaverse and create metaverse services for the future services for the future life. Yeah, thank you, thank you for all. Okay, so on behalf of the panel, then really thank you for attending this uh, panel session. So I really hope that you enjoy the rest of the uh, Congress. Uh, thanks again. <laughs>